Now, let me introduce our two fantastic speakers, Dr. Sabrina Curtis and Ellen Chiguanda. A special thanks to Ellen, who is joining us past midnight time in Zimbabwe. Sabrina J. Curtis is an education researcher and instructor at the George Washington University, where she currently is a visiting assistant professor in the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program and has taught courses on feminist theory, gender justice in education, and writing for social justice. Her research focuses on civic identity development and the influences of race, gender, class, and power on the civic and political lives and futures of Black women and girls. Sabrina has experience working with youth leadership development organizations where she has consulted on gender equity in education policy, provided youth advocacy training, and develop publicly accessible civic and political education courses for women and girls of color. She is also the co-founder of the Pyramid Project, a nonprofit mentorship organization serving youth in rural communities in Mississippi. Prior to beginning her academic career, Sabrina served as a political appointee in the Obama administration at the U.S. Department of Justice and the National Endowment for Humanities. Sabrina holds a PhD in education from the George Washington University, a master's in English from Texas Southern University, and bachelor's degree in English and political science from the University of New Mexico. Welcome, Sabrina. Ellen Chiguanda has a long history of leading CARE, one of the largest um, international development NGOs focusing on adolescent girls' education work in Zimbabwe since 2013. In 2016, she was selected as an Akina Global Scholar, a girl's Education Fellowship at the Brookings Institution, where she explored the link between girls' education and climate change. Ellen also was selected as one of 200 Obama Foundation Africa Leaders, a Pan-African Emerging Leaders program designed to invest in the next generation of the continent's thought leaders. She is currently based in Zimbabwe. Ellen is the advocacy advisor for CARE USA's education and adolescent empowerment team, responsible for working with education teams across CARE globally to ensure the CARE's programming evidence is used to influence local, regional, and international learning and influencing policy and practice in the education sector. She is also a co-chair of Gender Working Group at the Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies, or INE. In the past, she has also worked in various capacities on girls' and young women's empowerment with local NGOs in Zimbabwe. Ellen holds a master's in development studies and is currently working towards a PhD in development studies. Her research interests are focused on examining the relationship between girls' education and climate change, more specifically, the impact of extreme weather and climate events on adolescent girls' education in rural Zimbabwe. So today we will have a um, short presentation by Sabrina and Ellen, continued by a moderated discussion. We will then open up the floor um, for Q&A to, to engage with you all. We will start with Sabrina's presentation titled Black Girls Political Literacies, the Dialectics of Civic Practice, and then continue with Ellen's presentation on her PhD research and practitioner work on girls' education and cl climate change. So without further ado, I will hand over to our fantastic speakers. Um, Ellen and Sabrina, can you, do you want to just share your screens? Um, but just let me know if you need any help with it. Thank you. 
Let me see. I think I can share here. Can you all see my slides? Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, uh, Jason, for that wonderful introduction and for inviting me to uh, be in dialogue with you all this evening. Um, so I'll go ahead and jump in and get started since you already did a wonderful um, overview and I'll just go ahead and start talking here about my research. All right, put my timer on, okay. All right, so the research project, um, I'm gonna talk to, uh, for my research project, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about um, how I focus on the civic identity development and the civic experiences of young black women and girls. And so more broadly, as you can see on the screen here, I'm interested in the political socialization of young black women and girls. And this includes looking at the educational socialization processes and also the ecosystems and the institutions in which these processes occur and how they shape um, civic participation. Um, so I think a lot about how can we map the relationship between the ways that Black youth perceive how race, gender, class, and sexuality or other markers of identity influence the decisions that they make about the type of civic or political action that they engage in um, or how they engage in like socio-political analysis. Um, generally speaking, I'm very curious about what it means to live um, in a U.S. democracy as a Black girl, as a Black woman, and how do Black girls and Black women's experiences inform what we mean when we say things like civic engagement or democratic practice. Um, furthermore, I have um, broader sort of theoretical questions about what it means to educate towards global citizenship and what that also means for current debates on the form and function of civic and ci civic um, civic and citizenship education. So what could or what should civic or citizenship education look like? And so I'm interested here in some of these like broader um, tensions between global citizenship and anti-Blackness and how Blackness impacts uh, Black girls' sense of belonging um, or their civic responsibility. And so I um, am often thinking about this question of how do broader definitions and frameworks on gender equity and global citizenship actually erase the experiences of Black women and girls in the United States. And so I think we can do some additional unpacking here um, around race and citizenship and privilege and location as we think about citizenship and democracy. Uh, but for this evening, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about how I kind of arrived at this kind of work that I do before getting into some more uh, specifics about my um, dissertation project. And so um, this picture on the screen is a picture of me. I'm the fourth person back on the left side. And this um, is a picture of me in a youth organization. And so my experiences and really my research um, really stems from uh, growing up as a black girl in a low income family where my mother and my grandmother and my aunts were very active in serving community and leading youth um, organizations. And so this is a photo of me and our youth drill team and my mother um, on this next photo is here in the back left center next to the woman in the red beret. Um, and this is also, oops, excuse me, a photo of my grandmother uh, in her college yearbook. And so my grandmother and my mother were ministers of music and they were also youth directors. And so as a result of that history, I spent many years of my own childhood actively participating in youth programs and community engagement initiatives and really watching how my mother and my grandmother um, were very intentional about supporting young people and ensuring that they had educational and cultural opportunities that kind of extended beyond our immediate um, context. And so it's because of these experiences that I started to think about the role that family and culture and community play um, in identity formation and also um, in, in commitments to socio-political ideologies. So for my research, my dissertation research, um, which was titled Black Girls Political Literacies, the Dialectics of Civic Practice. Um, I had questions about what social or political issues 
Um, do Black girls believe are most salient and most important in their lives, right, and how they were making sense of those issues. And so I work pretty regularly with girls, with young people who are already civically and politically active, but I started to ask, you know, more critical questions about the reasons why and what issues were really driving some of their civic um, engagement. And so I wanted to also know how they would conceptualize potential solutions or remedies to some of the issues that they identified as being most important to them and their peers. Um, and to do this research, um, I framed my work using uh, theories on political socialization and also critical consciousness. And I'll just say very quickly, this, uh, this, concept, this concept on the left of political socialization by Ruth Nicole Brown uh, focuses primarily on positioning children and youth as social and political actors. Um, so for example, some of the more historical literature on social polit political socialization just focuses on young people becoming civic actors when they're 18. And so some of these more contemporary um, research frameworks uh, think about young people already as social and political actors and calls for definitions of politics to be more inclusive and also focusing on how Black youth are very important to our study of democracy. And then I also, as you see here, use critical consciousness as a primary framework as well, um, which kind of refers to the process by which oppressed and marginalized people critically analyze their social and economic conditions. And so for my study, um, I designed and facilitated a critical literacy course called Black Girl Politics. Um, I developed a curriculum for um, that would create opportunities for young people to examine the historical and contemporary experiences of Black women in politics and to explore the experiences of Black women and girls in Black life in America. And so the participants that I worked with at the time were 14 to 16 year old uh, Black girls who were members of an intergenerational organization um, and whose members of families who regularly engage in civic and social action initiatives. And so in creating this study, I had um, some research and pedagogical objectives, which were primarily to kind of explore the civic literacies of young Black girls, but also to give them opportunities to engage in some of this theorizing um, and to also develop further develop their their critical social analysis skills as well. Uh, so why is this research important? Um, one of the things I'll just say here is that despite the many ways that young Black women and girls are involved in community work and in public service and take on significant leadership roles in their families, the perceptions that we have of them are actually quite negative. Um, and so because of these social and discursive representations that we have about Black girls and how we juxtapose them against, no sh against um, ideas about white femininity, Black girls are often subjected to a range of punitive measures, which results in self-censuring, um, which results in isolation and also push out as well. And this continues to have significant implications for their civic identity development uh, as well, and also their systematic exclusion from educational space, educational and civic spaces as well. And so some of these deficit framings and perceptions of Black girls and Black youth more broadly also show up in civic education re research and in literature on political um, socialization. Um, I used a range of methods to collect data for this study, including literature circles, journal entries, and multimodal projects, which I'm happy to talk more about um, during our Q&A session today. But I'll just highlight a few findings for you, and then I'll close out and turn it over um, to Ellen. So um, for my findings, I found in my data that some of the issues that the girls were most concerned about um, included the underrepresentation, invalidation, and erasure of Black perspectives from highly politicized spaces, such as in schools or electoral politics. They were concerned with the hyper policing and surveillance of Black bodies and also the mental health and well being of Black youth in schools. And I also found that the girls um, were interrogating these issues through intersectional lenses. And so they often thought about the role that race and gender played in their lives. And they were also critically aware of their social locations and their geographic locations and how that also informed their thinking about uh, civic action and democracy uh, as well. 
And so here on the screen are just a couple of um, highlights um, that speak to these uh, findings. And so to close out, um, I'll say that this work has quite a few implications for uh, research. Uh, the first being that, I'm sorry, I'll go back a slide, uh, that youth workers and educators uh, would need to, you know, think more critically about how Black girls um, are, are socially located at the intersection of race, gender, class, and age, and this impacts their experiences in, in society, both within schools and in community, and also impacts their engagement uh, with educators and with civics as well. We have to think more critically about the insights that they have and entrusting their input on what they believe is meaningful and important when we think about social justice issues or educational issues and so forth. Um, but also this work um, has some insights for how we could reimagine civic education beyond the boundaries of school. So what does it mean to have a um, political identity? What does it mean to engage in civic and political discourse in ways that move beyond normative notions of civics um, and civic engagement? And then also that youth interest and their desires to drive um, should drive education and civic research as well. And so this is just a few highlights here um, from my work, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about what this means uh, for college and university and even graduate students as well, um, but also for um, broader ideas around democratic practice um, and thinking about how we reimagine social transformation for advancing democratic uh, values and ideas in our society. Thank you. Jason. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Yeah. Um, so Ellen, do you think you can share your screen or shall I sh help you with it? Uh, I just said I'll be able to share my screen. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> to that. Uh, let me just uh, um, would you like me to have my video on? Um, I think yeah, whichever works. I think Ellen, I El, so everyone Ellen is um usually based in Harare, but I think she's now in the field, right? So if if the video would disrupt the connectivity, just feel free to, you know, um, turn it off while I speak, um, whichever works for you. Yeah, maybe let me turn on my turn off my video for now, um, so that I don't risk losing my connection because I'm quite far away from the capital city. Sure, we see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let me do that. So thanks everyone uh, for joining us and also thanks for, for the very elaborate um, uh, introduction. My name is Ellen Chigwanda as already um, introduced by Jason. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I wanted to just start with a little bit of background in terms of who am I. Um, I know Jason mentioned, you know, my involvement and some of, you know, uh, the work that I've been involved in. Um, and so I have quite a journey in terms of working with adolescent uh, um, girls education and also young women in institutions of higher learning, having started uh, very early on in my career. Uh, joining a local sort of women and young women's um, leadership development organization um, at the time um, serving as a you know programs assistant essentially working to um, develop a program which was aimed at building the leadership capacities of um, young women in institutions of higher learning so you know looking at universities uh, vocational centers and also um, uh, teachers colleges um, and I was also involved in 
you know, working with different organizations that are, you know, you know, interested in sort of capacity building and capacity exchange um, and working with, you know, youth, young women and adolescent girls uh, in different local, regional and international um, spaces as well. Uh, following for that, I've also worked with a number of organizations um, in different places. Uh, including organizations such as CAMFED, such as uh, UN Women, um, and many others on a consultancy basis and essentially helping them to think through how to engage uh, young women and also adolescents um, in, in a number of different ways. Um, and in, in around 2012, 2013, I joined CARE, um, an international nonprofit, um, initially working here in Zimbabwe to lead uh, some of CARE's very first um, initiatives around adolescent girls' education, focusing primarily on identifying and addressing some of the key limiting factors to girls' education in uh, rural Zimbabwe. Um, so focusing on issues such as you know, poverty at the household level, self-limiting factors for the girls themselves, um, factors such as gender-based violence um, on the way to school and back from school, uh, issues around, you know, uh, learner materials, issues around distances travel to school. So essentially just really um, working with the government and the Ministry of Education to identify and to address some of those key limits that some of those factors that keep girls from going to school, stay in, staying in school, and also achieving positive learning outcomes. Um, and so at the moment, I you know, work as an advocacy advisor uh, for care, um, helping different country teams to think through how some of the evaluation data that we are generating through different evaluation points, baselines, midlines, endlines, um, and using that and, and really trying to translate that into, you know, different products that can influence, um, you know, a number of a whole rest of audiences, including government policy, other policymakers, donors, uh, practitioners around, you know, what works best to ensure that girls can stay in school and achieve, um, you know, their life um, aspirations. Um, so just thinking about my journey in terms of research on girls' education and climate change and, you know, what drove me to realize the importance of adolescent girls' education and climate change, I could say that um, based on this long history of working with adolescent girls um, and, you know, thinking through, you know, some of those key barriers to education for girls, especially in rural contexts, um, having been born in the rural areas myself, um, and a combination of my studies at the master's level, uh, where this included, you know, looking at uh, um, a module on, on development and the environment, um, and more specifically, a, an elective around climate change. I think the combination of those two was really the beginning of my curiosity around you know, if we've been thinking about all of these other barriers, uh, system, you know, system level barriers, barriers at the household level, barriers at the community level, barriers at the level of the girl herself, to what extent is climate change posing or exacerbating uh, some of those barriers to education for girls? In 2016, here in Zimbabwe, we experienced a regional drought. Um, in fact, in Southern Africa, um, and we did find in you know, some of our assessments that drought was really threatening to erode some of the development gains that we had realized as a result of some of our work. And so I think that's where really my, curios my curiosity was kind of um, ignited. And therefore um, I began really trying to apply you know, some of those principles from my master's course and you know, trying to apply that to my to the work that I was doing um, at the time, um, and even before that, I had also set up um, a should I call it trust or a sort of an organization um, 
which was focused on trying to understand uh, the links between gender, climate change, and um, education for girls in rural contexts. Uh, in 2016, I got a game-changing opportunity to, um, and was invited as a visiting scholar at the Brookings Institution. And I think it's quite close to George Washington University in Washington, DC, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, and we were invited to be you know, visiting scholars um, and to support some of their research on climate change and girls' education. In 2019, I was also selected as an Obama uh, Foundation Africa Leaders Program, again, based on my interests um, around girls' education and climate change. I've written a number of policy um, you know, uh, pieces, a number of articles, a number of blogs, essentially exploring this curiosity um, you know, of what, how does climate change um, interlink with, uh, with um, adolescent girls in rural areas. So in terms of my uh, PhD study, um, as I said, I'm really you know, interested in understanding the dual relationship between adolescent girls' education and climate change. More specifically, I'd like to understand the impact, you know, first of all, how does impact, uh, climate change impact girls' ability to um, you know, attend school, stay in school, and um, achieve positive learning outcomes. But on the other side, I would also like to understand how educating girls can kind of prepare them to participate in climate action and cl climate adaptation um, activities at different levels, starting at the household community and um, at the levels as well. Um, so in terms of theoretical frameworks, uh, you know, coming from a development studies background, I'm very interested in issues around human development theory, gender development theory, and actor-oriented theory. In fact, uh, in, in a sense, my PhD is really ch challenging the narrative that girls are in, you know, necessarily victims of climate change, but rather positioning them as a um, you know, key player or key contributor to, you know, the climate conversations based on their, you know, historical involvement in reproductive roles and also being at the center of, you know, managing household uh, sort of resources around water, fuel, um, energy, those kinds of pieces and how we can use that combined with their education experience to position them as key as a key part of the equation as far as climate uh, action is concerned. Um, my research is a qualitative case study design, um, and so I've you know decided to focus on a particular um, uh, area where I was able to help one of the, you know the schools to design a building climate resilient um, schools project, uh, focusing on how uh, they can ensure that the school continues to use sort of green technologies in order to ensure that girls can access water throughout the year. Um, and I used you know, different qualitative methods such as a qualitative survey, focus group discussions, uh, key informant interviews and adolescent drawings. Um, and my main research participants were adolescent girls between 10 um, to 19, but of course I looked at the broader uh, ecosystem as well. I'm in the process of actually writing, um, you know, thesis writing, and I used, you know, thematic analysis to try and engage uh, with my with my data. And so, just I know if just a few seconds left, I wanted to say a little bit about, you know, the work that I've been doing. I've already mentioned this pilot project, which I designed as part of my work with the Kidna Global. Uh, scholars program in Washington, DC, but I'm happy to say was kind of incorporated in my broader work at CARE. I'm also involved in a number of different advocacy and influencing engagements around education um, and you know, climate change issues. And um, more recently, I've also been involved in helping the organization to develop a youth leadership for climate change toolkit um, and all of this to say that um, initially when I started talking about girls' education and climate change in the same sentence, people felt that I was forcing an interaction, but more and more at the moment, you know, there's a whole movement to really try to understand how girls' education and climate change are linked 
um, and to really use some of this you know, research to inform some of our programming interventions and engagements at different level. Thanks, um, Jason. Um, maybe I'll be able to share a little bit more based on uh, the questions from the you know, participants and also from yourself. Thank you. Thank you both um, Ellen and Sabrina for um, for your present your introduction to your research and your practitioner work. Um, very, you know, we're really um, excited. It's th those are all exciting works, um, and we're very interested to learn more about um, your work on this topic on gender and education broadly. Um, so I think what we are going to do uh, for until about maybe like for the next 25, 30 minutes, it's um, I have a couple of questions um, to ask you um, to both of you or each of you. And then we will make I will make sure we have we, we will end that by around 630 so that I have um, time for you to respond to the questions from the uh, by from from our participants as well as i said please um type in any of your questions as you listen to our speakers yes um yeah so yeah so maybe we we can um and so yeah so i will so thanks, Lizzie and Elizabeth, for asking questions about um, um, yeah about that. So I did have a similar questions to El to Ellen as well. Could so Liz Elizabeth Lizzie is asking, um, could you share some successful or promising initiatives around girls' education and climate change? Um, actually. <laughs> yes, to be answered during the Q and A, but I do have a similar, um, you know, um, question to that. Uh, um, maybe Ellen, if you can tell us a little more about um, some of the preliminary findings from your research, um, and and how you're hoping your findings to be put into practice. I think maybe some of them are um, related to the questions about. Um, some of the successful or promising initiatives as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so, you know, I've been really engaging with, you know, the data that I collected as part of my PhD studies. Um, and it's been interesting to see, um, I was, you know, interested in looking at, so for instance, girls' experiences of drought, their experiences of floods, their um, experiences of heat waves, and also cold spells. Um, and it's been interesting to see how all of the, those different, um, um, you know, extreme weather and climate events have, you know, influenced girls' ability to attend school in rural areas. So looking at, you know, maybe at the level of infrastructure, flooded rivers, and how they can't cross rivers, um, issues around access to water. I found that water is actually a key predictor of attendance for adolescent girls in rural areas. So in you know, situations of you know, drought, they find themselves at the center of trying to collect water um, and also water not only at the household level, but also at the school level, um, you know, not only for their daily water needs, but issues around menstrual hygiene um, and other pieces. And also looking at even some of the health related issues, they talked about, um, you know, heat stress, they talked about how, um, you know, heat also contributes to their, um, you know, inability to, you know, concentrate, you know, during lessons. They talked about, you know, one of the interesting pieces that I found in the data, which was, which I, you know, didn't anticipate was mental health issues related to, for example, access to meals. So where schools are not able to provide school feeding um, because of you know, crop failures, um, which are drought related or related to floods, 
um, the you know, children themselves find it difficult to attend their lessons because their families are expecting that they're getting meals at school and they get to the school and there are no, there are no meals provided. So there's a whole host of um, interesting pieces coming out, but also opportunities for engagement for adolescent girls where they are already involved, for example, in environmental management, uh, within the schools. They are also involved in what they call continuous um, assessment learning activity, where they are given an opportunity to engage with the communities around them on a specific issue. Um, and so it, there's potential actually to use that learning activity for them to engage their community around climate change um, and to use that to inform uh, how the schools are responding to, you know, adaptation, but also using platforms such as the junior parliament um, and other leadership opportunities to feed into climate action and adaptation uh, processes. So lots of interesting pieces. And then in terms of um, promising initiatives, so this building um, climate resilient uh, schools initiative essentially builds upon the, uh, the work that we're doing around girls' leadership development in schools, where, girl, where we are exploring opportunities for girls to develop leadership capacities and then explore uh, ways in which they can act on that capacity. So once they've developed leadership, school in, uh, leadership skills, how can they identify some of the challenges within their schools where they can use um, their leadership capacity to engage school authorities to address some of those issues? So this pilot project which I designed, girls are essentially, uh, we essentially transformed a manually pumped um, borehole, which was really not providing water throughout the year into a solar powered water facility, uh, which provides for storage of water, um, 30,000 liters of water, which provides water throughout the year. Um, and so the girls are at the center of, you know, managing that facility, ensuring that, you know, they are, you know, controlling the pump, uh, making sure that, you know, they have a vegetable garden, which is supporting their, you know, nutritional needs. Um, and also looking at menstrual hygiene issues and how, you know, green technology can essentially transform girls' lives. When, and when I ask them, what is the one thing that you enjoy about your school? They, most of them were mentioning access to water because it has made their lives so much easier and gives them the opportunity to learn as opposed to spending so much time looking for, for water um, within the community or uh, within the school environment. So I'm really pitching that as a, you know, as a model for, you know, building sort of agency for girls to participate in climate action and adaptation um, conversations. Thanks so much, Ellen. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just um, really in it's interesting example of showing how this issue is um, all connected, not just education, but all connected to water and health in um, other um, girls empowerment issues um, all around, right? And their material conditions as well. Thank you so much. Um, thank you also so much for sharing your, um, you know, um, initial findings from research. Um, maybe um, I'll ask a, then um, similar questions to Sabrina. You did mention about, um, um, you know, the, the girls in your, the research, the adolescent girls you worked with um, chose to opt out from the normative notion of civics and institutional politics because of these structural barriers um, kind of um, influenced by political, social, and economic context in the U.S., and you did mention some of the thoughts, you know, food for thought about implications for research and reimagining civic education. Um, I do want you to ask, um, how are you hoping your findings to be put into practice to better support, you know, what are the priorities you think um, around all these implications to different policy actors at all different levels? Um, what are you hoping, how you're hoping your research findings to be put into practice to better support the political socialization of Black girls? Thank you for the question, Jason. Um, I guess just to give you a little more context and background. So the girls that I've been working with um, are part of an intergenerational 
nonprofit organization that provides you know leadership development and civic action training to Black girls um, and their families. And a lot of the work that they focus on varies across contexts and is very much rooted in some of the girls' um, interests and desires around you know public engagement and also social transformation. Um, and so the projects that they initiate are very much driven by them. Um, they do have, you know, program leaders and parents who are also very involved in this work, but the direction of this work is very much um, guided by their insights and their experiences. And so because of that, um, I, you know, started to ask these questions about, you know, what do they think about living these very hyper-politicized lives? You know, and I was, and the reason why I was asking those questions, right, is a lot of the research that we have on Black girls, you know, writes them as these these individuals who are living in hyper-politicized spaces and their bodies are politicized and all of these things. And so I was just curious, like, what do you all think about, you know, being called political? Are you political people? What does that look like? What does that mean? And so they really wanted to push back on a lot of that. And so we had a lot of discussion about how public spaces politics and even social media discourse can be very hostile um, towards Black women and girls. And so in many of our conversations, they often reflected on how women and girls are targeted on social media platforms, targeted in public, um, on TV, and how Black women are also very highly scrutinized, particularly if they're working um, in like local or even national politics um, or in other places of work. And, you know, they also hear these stories from their family members um, as well. And they're also very critically aware of or experience being ostracized or even ignored um, in schools. And so one of the girls would always, you know, say that she just simply did not feel welcome in these very public spaces where there was a lot of discourse um, and action happening around certain social justice um, issues. And so um, because of that, I, you know, was doing a lot of thinking around like these normative notions of politics, which typically focus on like voting or reaching out to elected officials um, or how some of the you know, more traditional research just focuses on what do we need to teach young people so that they'll be active citizens when they become adults, um, but really um, to push forth, you know, more ideas that young people are actually very active and involved in, in their worlds, in their societies, in their communities, and they're doing a lot of social action and political action work um, that should be, you know, commended, but also studied and interrogated um, in its own right. And so what the girls um, were really suggesting and arguing is that the work that they do, um, they do it because they do have a desire to improve, you know, their own educational or lived experiences, but also to make things better, you know, just for their friends or for their peers or um, other people within their um, communities. And so a lot of the work that they do um, you know, doesn't really fall under the scope of what we might consider to be traditional notions of politics uh, or civic engagement. And so when we think about reimagining civic education, um, a lot of that, you know, is rooted in this idea that we have to think more broadly about the role that communities and families play, even churches sometimes, um, and the roles that they play in nurturing young people's civic identities and nurturing their abilities or capacities to engage in public service or civic work or political work, um, and how we can start doing some research and teaching and writing around what does it mean to prepare people to be democratic actors um, in ways that kind of move beyond, you know, uh, I was, you know, Schoolhouse Rock always comes to mind for me, which is wonderful and important and necessary. And we, we have to do that too. But also be, if, if young people are engaging in much, you know, critically and radically different ways, we have to kind of push back on a lot of that literature and that research that says that these young people are, you know, politically disaffected or not civically apt, right? But we have to broaden our definitions and understandings of what civics um, is and also, you know, capture some of these, some of this movement in their work uh, in that way as well. Thank you. You were responding to my question, but you were also, I think, responding to one of our um, participants, one of our undergrads, Mimosa's um, question about um, 
what do you mean by reimagining re civic education? So that's great. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. Since you were already talking about reimagining civic education, do you want? Did you want it to kind of continue about she? She actually is asking whether should this reimagining be focused simply on formal education, or do you think it is important to supplement it with methods of um, informal education? I think she also like she's talking about more like community based education as well, right? Yeah, I, I think so. And I know that we do a lot of work already around, you know, school and community partnerships and so forth. Um, but we also, I don't think we talk a lot about what a school can, what those school community partnerships mean and what that should look like, right? But thinking about informal education or community-based education, not necessarily just as supplemental, but also just as critical and as critical and essential um, as education that's taking place within, you know, state sanctioned or government sanctioned um, spaces as well. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from um, spaces in which informal learning um, or community-based education is happening um, that we that we can use to inform educational processes and practices uh, inside of schools as well. And I think that this, you know, is important not only for K-12, but also when we think about um, universities. And so one question that comes up for me sometimes is how can our perceptions of Black women, young Black women and girls also hinder our efforts to build community with students in and outside of the classroom, but also for educators, um, how do some of our biases or lack of knowledge about uh, the experiences of Black youth outside of school, how those influence the type of academic support um, that they may need when they enter into universities as well. And even more so, you know, graduate students are also coming to our campuses with the host of life and educational experiences that really shade their perceptions of um, on their potential engagement and working relationships uh, with faculty and staff as well. And so when I think about the girls that I work with in community spaces and their stories, I also see how those stories are very much aligned with um, some of the work and research on Black graduate student socialization and the experiences faced by um, graduate students who also have to learn to navigate the social and political dynamics of their graduate programs, of their institutions, and also how to overcome some of those racial and gendered um, barriers that exist um, for them as well, right? And so there's lots of implications, I think, across um, all levels of learning, not just for students and graduate students and, you know, secondary students, but also for faculty as well, and thinking about how, how we can be more thoughtful and intentional about guiding students um, through various processes that lead them into more spaces of, you know, critical awareness and socio-political engagement um, and societal critique. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we are, I'm kind of combining, <laughs> I ended up combining my questions to the Q&A, so I think I'll just uh, do that way, <laughs> just to make sure I'm covering all of that. Um, um, continuing with um, Mimosa's question. Thank you, Mimosa. Mimosa is one of my undergrad students um, from who's exchange students from Netherlands who has been have been lived in I think six seven different countries so far already. Um, um, so the she so Mimosa has a questions for Ellen too that you mentioned Ellen you mentioned that during your research you have also looked at some of the system level barriers to girls education. What does government support and political will look like in relation to this issue in Zimbabwe? Could you just in general expand? Could you in general expand on? what some of the systematic barriers were within the context of rural Zimbabwe and how many of these barriers are linked to climate change as well? That's the first question, Ellen, if you can respond to that. And then her second question, she has two questions. She, another question is, 
Um, this is a slightly more on methodological questions, but she's also interested to learn about how you incorporated a method such as adolescent drawings into conducting thematic analysis. And this kind of ties in very well with my question too. So maybe you, can you respond to the first question and then we can talk, um, delve more into the method, methods related question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so when you look at the system level, I think um, there are definitely a number of in, um, issues to, to explore. Uh, when you look at some of the system level barriers, um, looking at essentially, you know, government as the, you know, uh, institution tasked with providing education um, that ensures access. And I think access is one of the pillars actually, um, you know, making sure that everyone is able to access quality education. And so there are a number of different uh, pieces, um, including, for example, domestic financing of education, issues around um, infrastructure. So when you look at some of the distances that, you know, girls and boys are having to travel, like in this area, my research area, um, girls in order to access secondary. So there are, I think, eight primary schools in that village, um, in that area. And in order to access the nearest secondary school, they have to walk um, uh, around 15 kilometers. I don't really know how many that, uh, miles that is, but 15 kilometers to school and 15 kilometers back home. So essentially on a daily basis, they are walking um, 30, 30 kilometers to and from school. So you can imagine, um, you know, they talked about walking through areas that are very unsafe where they are sort of unsavory um, characters, uh, you know, that expose them to, to violence. And more specifically linking that to climate change, you can imagine where there are floods, where there are storms, where there's, you know, there's a heat wave or a cold spell, or we're in the middle of a drought. They talked about walking those long distances um, and really, you know, limiting their ability to concentrate when they get to school, for instance. I remember in one of the interviews, the girl was saying, when I got to school, my fingers were so frozen from the cold, I could not even hold my pen and I could not concentrate in school. A lot of them don't have access to, um, you know, their families will not be able to provide um, warm clothing that, you know, enables them to really, you know, meet the, you know, um, address uh, some of the challenges associated with the harsh elements. So when you look at even infrastructure, you know, development and um, looking at some of the gaps in terms of the number of schools that are required, not only in this area, but across the country to ensure that, you know, children are not walking long distances, is definitely a system level barrier, uh, which is again, closely connected to domestic financing. Um, in my interview with one of the very senior uh, members of the Ministry of Education, uh, she was talking about, you know, the need to develop blue schools. That's what she called them, blue schools, ensuring that each and every school has access to safe, potable water for, for, for students, um, not only in the wet season, but also in the dry season. And then she also mentioned that we want the schools to be green, so blue and green schools that are able to use solar, um, we, you know, we are blessed with the sun in Africa. How can we essentially make sure that a lot of the schools are solarized so that they can, you know, access water uh, because it's such a predictor um, for attendance uh, in the schools, especially for girls. How can we make sure that, you know, uh, schools are, are developed in order to do that? To do that? So domestic financing um, conversations, how schools are supported to you know, become blue schools or green schools. Um, and so this building climate resilient schools project is really you know, trying to model that. How, how can a school, how can essentially having that critical resource around water enable girls to, to, attend, to attend school? And the village itself actually has rallied the community around to build a, 
um, they call it a satellite school. So a school that is uh, a secondary school that will be providing education for the children within the village, but has not yet been registered as a, as a fully functional school by the government. That is kind of a work in progress. So that will also enable the girls themselves to access secondary education much closer, which may or may not you know, limit some of the barriers that are climate related and enable them to also um, connect uh, with the education system. And then, you know, you're also looking at issues around participation, um, participation in our society, traditionally adolescents or young people are not really seen as a demographic that has something to contribute. So even within the home, uh, you know, if we're having conversations around budget, conversations around infrastructure within the home, young people are not typically involved. And so we are really trying to position um, young people as, you know, people with voices, with a sense of agency, how can their experience inform how decisions are being made at the school level, at the community level, and also at the national level? Um, and what opportunities can government themselves provide within the schools to ensure that adolescent girls can contribute to some of that decision making at different levels? Um, so, I think maybe that's the you know response I can give. So yes, there are definitely a number of different um, you know barriers at the system level. But in terms of political will, the government has actually worked on a they're calling it I think a disaster risk reduction in schools um, program um, or strategy that is aimed at really. You know, when we look, I don't know, you know, how many of you knew about uh, Cyclone Idai, which is, you know, we experienced Cyclone Idai in the region, I think in 2019, and the education sector was actually one of the worst affected. We had one school that was essentially covered by water, some students actually died. Um, and so the education sector has traditionally not been linked to climate change, and yet there are so many ways in which it's affected by climate change. So more and more there are conversations around how the Ministry of Education should be putting in place strategies that help the schools, the education system to anticipate and to plan for different disasters and how that can also help to ensure that you know, children can con continue to access school. So for instance, in the case of a flood, how can, you know, children continue to access education in the case of a drought, in the case of, you know, extreme weather, you know, events, what, you know, what, what um, approaches can be used to make sure that, you know, children can still write their exams, they can still access education. And education is really a space where children feel safe. So how can it be a non-negotiable priority in a climate emergency? Um, and then in terms of the methodolo methodological question around drawings, um, you know, as I was, you know, engaging with the literature, some uh, in my research um, participants really, you know, were within the 10 to 19 range, so both primary level and secondary level, and, um, you know, going through the literature, I found that, you know, drawings, children have uh, you know, different ways of expressing themselves, especially with a complicated subject like climate change, just asking a child who's, you know, 10 years old or 11 years old, what climate change is may not necessarily resonate with them. And so, uh, you know, one of the questions that I, you know, one of the activities that I gave them as part of data collection was to say, in, you know, in what, what is your vision for the school? Like in, for you to, based on all of these experiences you're describing around, you know, cold spells, heat waves, droughts, floods, what would a climate resilient school look like for you? What would, what would make school more enjoyable for you to address some of these challenges? So they were able to draw. In some cases, they were drawing um, for some schools that didn't have you know, water within the school system. They were saying, you know, they were drawing, for example, water taps or a, water, or a borehole. In some cases, they were saying, we don't have electricity. So even if our teachers wanted to you know, provide um, ICT, 
you know, education or use ICT to share materials with us, they couldn't do that. Some of them were drawing trees, fruit trees, that we should have more trees within the school that help us protect, that act as windbreakers and protect us from, you know, the, the you know, strong gusts of wind that affect us sometimes. So, you know, the, the adolescents got an opportunity to kind of express their thoughts around climate resilient schools or education through those drawings. And so I have had to and continue to do that even as I write, had to then sort of draw the themes that are emerging from those drawings and connect them to the you know, qualitative survey to draw out some of the you know, codes and themes uh, emerging from those drawings and connect that to, um, to the broader sort of research objectives and research questions that I had going into, into this research. This is not really something I'd uh, done before uh, in terms of the thematic analysis, but um, it's been really interesting to engage with some of those um, adolescent drawings. Thanks. Yeah, Ellen. Ellen, do you plan to have those drawings directly as part of your, um, I don't know how you're just, are you going to just um, analyze it um, and then present, um, and then just include it as a part of the other data or will you kind of have the drawing itself um, presented in your findings, um, you know, findings of the dissertation research as well? So this is actually an uh, ongoing sort of debate with my supervisors um, around how we're going to incorporate some of that into the actual thesis. So my plan was to include some of the drawings, probably not all of them, but sample some of them to include in the thesis. Um, and we were actually we are actually planning to write uh, a, a journal. I'm planning to write a paper around you know, those adolescent drawings as a data collection method in qualitative research. Um, and my experiences around it, some of the challenges, some of, I mean, some of the exciting pieces, but also some of the challenges that I faced uh, in terms of you know, analyzing um, you know, the drawings and incorporating some of the findings into my research. So yes, some of them will make their way into my thesis. Um, and like I said, it's a bit of an ongoing uh, debate at the moment with my uh, supervisors, with my professors. Yeah, thank you. We've read up in my qualitative research methods course, um, we read about, you know, students read about art-based um, research projects and um, interesting to, I'm sure they're interested to learn about that, that what you, you are doing. Um, I will also ask um, Sabrina about um, different methods, um, data collection methods you use. And um, Sabrina, I understand you also had lots of participant generated data that young girls um, were part of the um, data production themselves. And you actually incorporate that into your dissertation findings nicely. Maybe can you talk a little bit more about how that process was um, um, so that we can learn from it? Yeah, thank you. So um, when originally when I was sort of um, thinking about how I was going to approach this research, I had all sorts of um, different ideas. I had already been in community with this particular group of girls for over two years, and I had a good sense of sort of, you know, what they were interested in from a civic engagement perspective, but I also wanted to learn more about what was really driving um, some of that work, but I also understood that these were girls who had been in this organization for some time. Some of them had been in the organization for 10 years, uh, were, you know, about a year and a half away from going to college, and so their needs and desires were changing um, and didn't always align with what, you know, the organization, you know, had in mind for what type of learning and engagement they should be participating in. And so um, prior to the start of the research, and this was before the pandemic happened, but then, you know, the pandemic started before I started collecting data, I, um, you know, stayed in communication with them and um, you know, just had casual conversations about what, you know, if, if we are, if we're going to continue to sort of have this ongoing literacy engagement in this critical space, you know, what, what would that look like for you? You know, what, what would you want to do? What's interesting? Um, 
you know, these are, you know, the ideas that I have around like political education and whatnot. Um, but kind of much to my surprise, um, some of the older girls in the group said, well, you know, graduating soon. And honestly, we hope that, you know, our engagement will lead to, you know, products or um, artifacts that we can use for, um, you know, maybe for sharing online, but more importantly for, you know, their portfolios, right? And so this, mind you, you know, this is a community space, but these are girls who are going to college. And so they wanted to do things that would prepare them <laughs> to go to college. Uh, and so I thought like, okay, well, you know, what, what might that look like, you know, thinking about the different types of schools they might apply to and go to. And so um, I thought that, okay, instead of me just going in here and, you know, having these conversations and collecting data, um, how can we create together and how can we design um, projects or multimodal projects that would really speak to um, who they are and what they do. And so we decided collectively that they would um, do some journal writing, which is what they already enjoy and do quite often on their own. And so that was a way of data collection. And so sometimes I had prompts for them and sometimes I did it. Some of them wrote, you know, very freely and openly. Um, but then also since I had, you know, these questions about social issues and processes or policies that we might use to address social issues, I thought that, okay, instead of talking to them about how to, you know, um, write a policy brief or something like that, you know, something that might be too dry for a 14 or 15 year old, uh, we thought about like, okay, how do we share our recommendations and our ideas and our solutions with the world in a way that's more creative or more multimodal um, in that way? And so that's how we arrived at, um, you know, collectively creating multimodal policy projects that gave them, um, you know, sort of free range over how they would articulate issues that they cared about um, and what they would do if they had the opportunity to sort of address them or raise awareness about them. And so um, journal, these journal entries and the multimodal projects became kind of the core focus um, of my data uh, also just our engagement over books, right? And so it was a literacy space. And so we used texts that were written by Black women and girls. And that was, you know, poetry. They were policy texts. They were films, different types of media. And so just having conversations about uh, those pieces and what it meant to them um, and how it informed their thinking on race and gender and moving about in this particular society. And so those conversations were also very key. Um, to my data collection as well. And in terms of analysis, um, like Ellen, I also use thematic analysis, but I also work with the girls in that and have frequent you know, group and individual conversations that are pretty organic in nature um, that you know, gives me the opportunity to kind of verify data or to clarify some things that they've said or been thinking about. Um, but also I share with them things that I'm writing <laughs> all the time. Uh, so also give them the opportunity to push back and say, hey, well, that doesn't, I wasn't really saying that or that doesn't make sense. Um, and so it really is an ongoing kind of generative process that is kind of circular in nature. And it, there's, it's hard to really find an endpoint to that analysis because it, it is kind of ongoing and ideas evolve. Um, but I just, you know, try to in, may, make sure that they're involved at all stages um, of the data collection uh, and analysis as well. Sabrina, can you tell when you, I think you can maybe elaborate a little more what multi-model um, um, model means in this context. And I know you had in your present PowerPoint, you have uh, some examples of it if you want to share actually, yeah. Is yeah, that do I have in this power, I'm not sure. Um, in this PowerPoint, do I have, I don't have a good example in this particular PowerPoint, but um or do I, uh, okay, so for one, so multimodal in that um, the text and the artifacts that the girls were creating, um, you know, had some sort of written component to them, but they were um, used different modalities to express their ideas and their messages. And so that may have been creating films or short clips or videos, um, one of a, a couple of the girls created photo journals, um, which was also interesting to seeing how they were working with images and text as well. Um, one of the girls is musically very talented and her family is very musical and she wrote an original score 
So a, she, you know, wrote a piece of music that reflected how she felt um, about some of these issues, particularly around um, policing and surveillance and body politics. And so she was like writing music that like um, emotionally expressed, you know, how she felt about those ideas. And so a lot of it, you know, it, it varied, you know, across the, you know, what the girls were interested in, what they wanted to do, um, which, you know, as a researcher, right, that can make it hard for analysis. You're like, how do I look at all of these <laughs> different pieces and come to some conclusions about uh, what they're saying here? But it also made for very insightful, um, insightful conversations and also made the work, you know, just really come, uh, to life. And so those type of projects, um, you know, were fun to do, but also to hear them talk about them and why they created them um, in that way. Yeah, um, yeah, she, I know there were like really interesting multimodal projects mm -hmm. um, that girls pro um, created. So maybe, um, maybe we can <laughs> later there another opportunity to share the examples. But I wanted to make sure I cover some other questions here. Michael is our um, scholar in residence and who has been like the core member of ITEF for 20 some years, right? So um, just wanted to say hi. And then he has questions to you, each of you and both of you actually. To Sabrina, what are you noticing? Um, are the forms of civic association Black girls are inventing, reimagining, and enacting for themselves? And to both uh, both Ellen and Sabrina, how would you explore the idea that rural girls in Zimbabwe and Black girls in the U.S. are self-directed action learners rather than beneficiaries waiting to be helped of protected or noticed by others? Shall we, um, I don't know, Serena, since you're talk, talking, already talking, do you want to continue um, elaborating yeah. about response? Uh, yes, I'll just share briefly. Thank you for those questions, um, Michael. I will say um, the some of the civic um, projects and social action initiatives that the girls have generated and implemented in their communities very much grew organically out of conversations or personal experiences. And so if I can give you a couple examples um, and just to also give you a little bit of a broader context. So this organization is based in New Jersey, but some of the families are also, um, some of the girls are second and third generation. And so they have families in different countries um, and travel quite a bit back and forth when their families are able to. Um, and so their projects, started out, I would say several years ago, very domestic in focus, very much rooted in their immediate community context. But over the years, they have developed uh, much larger initiatives that they've implemented in places like Jamaica and Haiti um, and elsewhere. And so, for example, um, one of the earlier projects that the girls um, started was around literacy. And so one of the girls was, uh, uh, avid reader and writer and just felt very disconnected from her English classrooms and was very concerned that all of the books that they were reading did, never featured Black kids as characters or protagonists and things like that. And so she, you know, started this like social media initiative that she thought would, you know, generate some interest, but ended up becoming this very large national initiative. Um, and it was a hashtag that she created called 1000 Black Girl Books. And that led to the creation of a project that has now, you know, since delivered um, over 20,000 books to different schools around the countries, all of which um, have Black girls in the main character. And so as a result of that project, the girls have been very instrumental in working with schools and different organizations that have these very these conversations about what does it mean to center Black girls or marginalized youth in books, and how does that help to connect learners across backgrounds um, and contexts, right? And so that's just kind of one example um, of one of the early initiatives that they've implemented. Um, one of the girls was very interested in addressing poverty um, and had some connections with um, an organization that was working in Haiti, and she was able to do some uh, some educational forums around education and young people in Haiti, 
And what came out of that ended up being a years long campaign to direct resources, both in the form of money, but also food and cattle and other um, resources um, that they're now able to direct towards this particular um, community in Haiti uh, each year. And so all of these projects are just very much driven again, by what they're interested in. Another girl was very interested in de uh, um, removing the stigma around menstrual cycles um, and periods. And so she's very active in um, which you were seeing, starting to see a lot of young people focus on this period poverty campaign. And she's been really instrumental in not only creating um, pantries in the schools in her district that, you know, uh, give out uh, menstrual supplies to young people, but now has been able to also push legislation in her state to ensure that those menstrual products are always free and accessible to young people in the school in her area. And so again, these are kind of the things that kind of get overlooked <laughs> in the research on civics and civic engagement. Um, that's, you know, that's very much happening, not just with this group of girls, but, you know, with young people uh, across the country as well. And then to your second question, I'll just say um, very quickly, uh, in terms of, I think these girls um, over the years have really come into themselves and see themselves as agentive um, and are able to really make decisions about the type of work um, that they want to do, but also recognizing um, that waiting to be helped right usually results in not much. And so they've been very, um, they've learned over the years how to speak up for themselves, how to stand up for themselves, but also to push back on things that they don't, that they think don't serve them well. Um, and then when things don't serve them well, I think that they've been able to find ways to work with each other or to work with the adults in their lives to um, create new ideas or to get things changed. And so, um, I think that's kind of some of the key um, aspects of this work and their motivations. Um, but, you know, it varies. I also work with young people in different spaces in rural communities, for example, in Mississippi as well. Um, and, you know, things look a little bit different in terms of access to resources and what community organi organizing looks like. But I think what we find um, in rural, particularly in rural Black communities um, in the South, in the American South, um, despite the lack of resources, uh, economic resources, um, at that, these are communities who are, you know, have been around for generations, and they are highly organized, and they have intergenerational and communal um, and collective work that um, allows them to sustain themselves when, you know, state agencies or the government or whomever else is not providing, you know, resources in the way that they should. And so I think we kind of overlook the um, the beauty of rural communities in that way and that because they are isolated and because all they have is themselves that they're able to really do more than we might um, expect not being from those places. Thank you. Um, similar, same question to Ellen. I think um, that Michael asked, um, how would you explore the idea that rural girls in Zimbabwe, um, maybe reflecting on what Sabrina said, if you find any similarities and differences um, in terms of their self-direct agency, um, having voice um, as self-directed act, self -directed action learners rather than beneficiaries waiting to be helped. Um, or protected? Thank you. Um, I think that's such an interesting question. And in fact, my, my research or my thesis is kind of, you know, trying to position girls as exactly that. Um, as I said earlier, trying to, you know, really challenge the narrative which is accepted. When you look at, um, you know, climate change, one of the biggest pieces is issues around vulnerabilities, right, which are influenced by gender, by age, by geography. Um, but also, I'm kind of testing out, um, you know, one of the theories by Norman Long, looking at actor-oriented, um, you know, approaches, which essentially, you know, argues that, um, you know, people within, although 
you know, the concept of human development is obviously influenced by, you know, different, you know, uh, outside forces. Um, the, you know, interventions are essentially mediated by life experiences, which is why I wanted to understand girls' experiences of different climate and with, you know, extreme climate and weather events. Um, and, you know, their perceptions in terms of, you know, so how have you managed that? How have you been helping each other? How do you support each other? And they were talking about, you know, helping each other, you know, having to avoid a flooded river so that the younger ones don't drown. They were talking about, you know, how, you know, in one of the schools they were saying, we actually tried to talk to the community about how you can we can share the borehole and give each other turns, especially in um, during the times when water is a little bit more scarce. How do we kind of allocate resources, the water resources, so that you know us as the students who need water within the school because this is a shared resource. How can we also access the water, but also enable the communities to also. Um, access that water. So essentially, you know, Norman Long is saying um, individual actors do have the capacity to process their own social experiences and devise ways of coping, um, even under the most extreme of, um, of circumstances, and that they can actually exercise power, even if they are seemingly highly um, you know, in a very sort of difficult or subordinate position, and that the experiences have given them the knowledge, the skills, and the capacity to act on some of those challenges and bring in their own lived experiences to design ways of coping with that. So I'm exploring some of that. Obviously, when you look at adolescent girls, they're very young. Um, there are issues around, you know, safeguarding, child protection. In some cases, some families are actually resorting to having the girls kind of um, uh, stay near the school, near the secondary school to avoid some of these um, climate related challenges, but also other sort of macroeconomic issues as well. So the girls are kind of uh, staying near the school. They rent one room for that girl, um, you know, in places that are close to the school where the child is essentially staying on their own, which brings you know, all sorts of, you know, child protection issues. Um, the girls were talking about, you know, issues around abuse because essentially they are staying far away from their villages, far away from their parents so that they avoid the flooded rivers so that they don't have to walk these 15 kilometers and, you know, are not exposed to the elements. And of course, other, you know, issues, as I've said, but climate change seems to be a, a big part of that equation. And so, um, Certainly, I think there are different things to explore. Um, looking at how girls, you know, themselves have a sense of agency and voice, and how the education system is a platform for building resilience, um, for resilience building. What are they learning? I also explored what are they learning about climate change? What subjects? Um, what do the teachers know? How, how are the teachers themselves engaging with climate change beyond just talking about it in geography class? Um, is this something that they see as a day-to-day -day, um, issue that they can actually engage with? And there are also sort of capacity gaps at the level of the teachers themselves in terms of translating that academic um, literature or curriculum into um, you know, pieces that can be used by the students themselves as far as climate change in the real world is concerned. So yes, definitely, it's part of my sort of interests to ch challenge that narrative that girls are necessarily victims, but that there is potential. Yes, they're vulnerable because of age, at their adolescence because of, um, you know, gender and sex issues, they are, you know, adolescent girls, but also geography, they are in these rural contexts. But what experiences, skills and capacities do they possess because of their experiences at home in the community and at the school that can contribute to them as, uh, as a key part of uh, climate action and adaptation strategies um, at different levels. Thank you, Ellen. I, Ariana has a question. I think um, I'll first ask um, to Ellen if see if um, Sabrina also has a 
some thoughts on this, but Ellen, do did you, did, do you run into issues with development organizations or NGOs treating women as a monolithic, um, children as a monolithic and Black ex existence as being a singular experience? How do you deal with this? Um, and is sampling important, especially in such intersectional and powerful anti-oppressive work that you do? Thank you. Um, um, and I think this has also been uh, my, what should I say, that's the, those are some of the experiencing that I'm bringing to this research, right? Uh, because I have, you know, deep roots in the women's movement um, in Zimbabwe. Um, also, you know, as I worked with the young female activists in different institutions of higher learning, um, the work that I've done, you know, through both local, uh, regional and international uh, NGOs is that we do run into that um, sort of space where, uh, you know, this, you know, we've defined, you know, this vulnerable uh, adolescent girl who is um, essentially, you know, we've kind of modeled what, uh, you know, what a, what a vulnerable young girl looks like in rural Zimbabwe, right? Um, and which is where the importance of research is coming in. Recently, I attended an education symposium at the African Union. And, you know, they were talking about how research can essentially help to model some of this, you know, strategies that, different education systems are, are using. And I know earlier on you also asked a question around how do we, how will this research contribute to that? And I think my research will have a lot to do um, in terms of informing um, NGO work, informing how local women's and women-led and women's rights organizations are engaging with, um, you know, adolescent girls and youths I know there's a lot of intergenerational dialogue um, happening, um, especially through you know local women's and and uh, women-led and women's rights organizations within Zimbabwe. There's also a lot of sort of youth movements that are you know that have been in existence, but that are also sort of growing organically as young people become more aware of the issues that are around them. And so certainly, I think um, that that's that's a very important piece to. Explain. Explore and I continue to explore even as I write and continue to engage with the literature around, um, you know, our perceptions or notions of, you know, how we perceive young people or how we perceive adolescent girls within a particular setting and what their role could be in terms of addressing some of their issues. The piece around uh, sampling was quite, um, uh, you know, was quite key to, to my work because I know we, we debated a little bit in terms of defining an adolescent, looking at what does that mean in a rural setting? What does that mean? What are some of the experiences that they're bringing to the research? Um, which definition of you know adolescence should we be using? We thought a lot about this with my with one of my supervisors. What is the definition of adolescence, and why why adolescence? Um, and for me, because of all of the work that I've been doing with adolescent girls, and how this is such a key and defining moment in a young person's life, how they are shaping their ideas, how they are starting to really look beyond themselves and looking at their peers. Um, looking at their community, looking at the environment around them, shaping issues around career development. And so I found that this is an important demographic and also even looking at Africa and how even when you look at population trends in our country and how this demographic is very, very important. And so uh, that influenced a lot of decisions around my sampling frame um, and how I chose to sample uh, my research participants um, for, for the data collection process as well. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I know we have like a minute left, but Sabrina, can you also share some, you know, like brief thoughts about um, Ariana's question? Yeah, I won't say too much. Uh, so I feel like you know Ellen covered that so 
Brilliantly. The only thing I'll say about um, sort of within this U.S. context is there's a lot of emerging work coming out of um, what we call Black girlhood studies. And a lot of this work is done by scholars who consider them, you know, selves to be Black feminist scholars. And so there's a lot of limitations around that, right? Because some of these critical race and Black feminist and other feminist theories, right, are very much centered on the lives and experiences of adults. Um, and so it tends to also flatten uh, the experiences of girls, adolescents, girls, and teenagers, and so forth. Um, but also because of that, um, and because of, you know, we also kind of think about the tensions and the um, intersections of race as well, oftentimes uh, a focus on racial experiences, um, flatten, you know, the ex uh, flatten the reality of how people um, experience and express gender as well. And so a lot of the work that's coming out on Black girls, particularly in the education space, very much is Black girls, right, with not a lot of attention paid towards sexuality um, and the expansiveness of gender identity. And so um, there are some, you know, people are doing a lot of great work around uh, queer students and how do we support transgender students in schools, um, but a lot of that is not being talked about in uh, specifically in regard to, you know, Black girls and how they're also dealing with navigating gender identity as well. And so as a result of that, not just in terms of academic research, but there's a lot of youth um, community-based organizations that are not attending um, to those intersections, which and even in their attempts and efforts to make inclusive spaces for young people um, are actually, you know, implementing programs that um, end up being quite exclusive because they kind of ignore the actual realities um, of young people who don't really fall into the, um, you know, scope of what it means to be a cisgender you know, Black girl. And so I think we have a lot of work around, you know, in youth organizations and community spaces to also think about how do we account for and acknowledge the um, real challenges um, that queer students, Black queer students, Black girls um, are facing in society. Thank you so much, Bo. You thank you so much, Bo, Sabrina, and Ellen. Ellen, thank you so much. I know it's 2 a.m. in Zimbabwe. I'm so we are so like, you know, we are so happy to have you, but like so sorry that it's so late. Um, and I and thank you everyone for participating um to in the conversation actively today. Um, yeah, so I think we um, besides, so the my class, um, qualitative research methods class will just, um, you know, have additional 15, 20 minutes here, but I think other than other students and other, um, other community members or, um, other people joining elsewhere, I think you're, I think it's a time to say goodbye and thank you so much for joining us. Um, maybe see you at the next, um, Global Education Forum. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank the invitation. Thank you, Sabrina Allen. I so Thank enjoyed you. it. Thanks, Take everyone, care. for coming. G-Sun, well done. Thank you. Really, really great and moving. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>